good evening. Good to see you all tonight. Let's take our hymnals. Turn to number 481, Sunlight. Number 481, we'll stand and sing verses 1, 2, and 5. <laughs> to see you tonight. Uh, a couple announcements real quick. Just a reminder about the church uh, bowling and skating coming up on uh, April 20th over at Martinsburg. And if you're going to go to that, make sure you sign up. Uh, and probably a number of the people besides your name that are going to come. Uh, the ladies Bible study uh, that begins Tuesday, March 19th, seven week course. Uh, it'll be 6.30 to 7.30 in the evening. Today's the last day to sign up for that because they have to get the books ordered. So ladies, if you're going to attend that starting on March 19th, you need to make sure you sign up tonight for that. And the uh, Precious Life uh, Spring Banquet, the, uh, it's $20 a person. If you are interested in attending that, uh, you can see Amy Hauser for uh, tickets for that and uh, prayers uh, same as this morning Jacob uh, gets that injection in his eye tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. that's what that's that's the time it's scheduled for the unspoken for somebody that has a procedure tomorrow and this morning I mentioned Janet uh, that was passing and Lori told me that she passed today during church she was she passed into eternity so uh, just pray for her family if you would and that is all the announcements that I have so I want to pray and then I'll turn it back over to Adam so let's pray together Father uh, we we praise you for this evening praise you for the nice day Lord what a beautiful day it was thank you for the sunshine and the warmer temperatures and uh, tonight Lord the, the fact that you brought us back here and in this evening Lord we are at the end of our service we will stop and we will remember the body of our Savior Jesus Christ and the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. We will reflect back to the best of our ability in our minds to the cross to remember what he went through for us. What a great reminder uh, for all of us in this midst of this world that gets, when we get so busy, Lord, just to stop and to reflect and to understand and uh, Lord, the fact that uh, we are who we are because of what he did on the cross. And Father, we have so much to be thankful for. We have all the spiritual blessings. We are rich. We are abundantly rich in Christ. And Lord, we have a living hope. And knowing that someday we shall be with him. And uh, Lord, we look forward to that. And so, Father, we thank you for that hope that we have and at the same time, we're reminded that we aren't there yet. And so we are still here in the midst of a fallen 
depraved world, and so we need to learn, we need to grow, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight in our study of Colossians again. So, Lord, speak to our hearts, I pray, challenge us tonight, uh, might your blessing be on the uh, junior church and the students and the teachers there and upon us here. And Lord, as we go through the message, might you just prepare our hearts for that time to come to your table tonight. We'll thank you for it all. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. One more song tonight, number 402. Faith is the victory, number 402. We'll dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Um, also, don't forget the announcement about Vacation Bible School. The sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Um, if you'd like to help for VBS, we'd appreciate the help. Number 402, you can remain seated. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Colossians chapter 2, if you would. I'll read a couple verses. I'll start in verse 1. If you need a copy of the notes, raise up your hand. I've got everybody covered. One prayer request that I did not mention. Uh, Jan has a heart cath tomorrow. Am I correct, Jan? Early in the morning? Till 11.30. Okay, so, so we need to pray for Jan tomorrow for that heart cath. Also, you're welcome. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of Colossians, it reads like this. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ, as ye have therefore received 
Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, as we come tonight, Lord, we ask that our eyes and our hearts would be open. Might the Spirit of God move freely in this room tonight to teach and instruct us. Lord, I mentioned right before I read for Jan, Lord, I pray for her, for the heart calf tomorrow. Pray everything goes well, no problems, no complications whatsoever. Uh, Lord, help her to come out of there, get back on her feet. And uh, Father, with nothing found out of any uh, major deal, uh, we pray. Give her peace and comfort tonight as she sleeps. Pray for her doctor that he would be rested tomorrow. And we ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're back here to our letter that was Paul wrote from prison to the church that he had never met, to the church at Colossa, because heresy had crept into the church. And so I want to come right back to your paper, and I want to get into this because there's a lot of really good information here tonight, and And I want to uncover that, and then, uh, of course, we have the Lord's table at the end. But here's what it says on our introduction. It says, in our study of Colossians last week, we looked at the first three verses of chapter 2. So let me read those verses, and just not a lot, but just let me uh, expound on them just a little bit. Paul said this, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So that verse tells you that he's never met these people. But it also tells you, I believe, that one thing that we can see is that the heresy had not only reached the church at Colossa, but also the church of Laodicea. It had, it had reached into that church also. And Paul had this huge burden, uh, this conflict, which probably led to a lot of prayer for these people. And he was very, very concerned, and rightly so, uh, for the reason that if, if the heresy was adopted and would get mixed in with the gospel, then the gospel would not be the gospel uh, whenever it had legalism mixed in with it, uh, Judaism or uh, whatever it might be that, that they were carrying in. And so Paul was very concerned because he did not want to see the message of uh, the gospel polluted in any way. So he's been praying for these individuals. And watch, watch how, I think this reflects how he prays. And it also reflects what was actually going on in the church. Uh, and, and here's what he says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. He said that, I believe, because... One thing that false teaching will do, it'll cause division whenever it comes within a church. And so he said, look, you all need to be knit together in love and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. That was a, that's a request for them to be solid and grounded in the assurance of their salvation, which was vitally important. We talked about that last week, about how if you get a group of people that are solid in their, in their salvation, then whenever this heresy would come in saying, you know what, Christ isn't enough, you need to do this, this, or this, they'd say, no, 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 we're already saved. But you get somebody that is, that is unsure of their salvation, somebody that is not deep in the word, and they are not convinced in their own hearts of their own salvation, then somebody comes in and they're quick to grab onto something else because deep down inside they are looking for an assurance, and so they look to whatever else is offered for the assurance instead of looking to Christ. And so he wanted them to have this assurance of their salvation. He goes on to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. In other words, he wanted them to know who they were, who they were in Christ and that they were part of the body of Christ. And then he goes on, verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he wanted them to understand the riches that they had in Christ. It, it, they, bottom line was he wanted them to be rooted and grounded. So let me go back to your paper. Let me run down across here a little bit. In these verses, Paul expresses his desires 
his desire for the Colossian believers as well as those at Laodicea. He desired that they remain knit together in love so as not to be divided by the heresy that had come into the church. He desired that they remain steadfast in the assurance of their salvation and understand who they were in Jesus Christ. He desired that their knowledge of God would increase so that they would possess the greater treasure, the great treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are found in our Lord. Paul knew that the deeper these people were grounded in the word of God, the better they would stand against the heresy that was being brought in. That was the bottom line. He knew that. And that's what he wanted for them. So let me go on here. What's the application? Last week we looked at how knowledge and wisdom have to be pursued if we're going to possess them in our lives. And I gave you these verses last week, and I just want to share them one more time because they are so very important. Watch Proverbs 3, 3 through 8. Solomon writes this, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures. Let me stop. So to, to gain more knowledge of God, to gain more knowledge of our Savior, of our Lord, it takes work. It, it, just, like Paul, just like Solomon says here, it is like seeking after silver. It is like seeking after a hidden treasure. It takes labor. It takes work. It takes labor in the Word. It takes time in the Word. Watch uh, the next verse, if you would, verse 5. Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. So if we seek after knowledge, God will give us the knowledge. But we also need the wisdom. And I told you last week, there's a difference in the two. Knowledge is understanding the facts. Wisdom is learning and knowing how to apply it in life. That's the difference. Knowledge is having the facts. Wisdom is knowing how to live it and apply it to our lives. We need both. It's not enough just to have the knowledge, but we also have to have the wisdom. We have to know how to apply that to our lives. Watch. Let me go on now and show you the result. Okay, watch verse 4. Now, we just we touched on this briefly, and I'm not going to stay long on this verse because there's a lot more to see. He says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So that verse says a lot right there. This I say, what I just said before, that uh, this is what I desire for you. Knit together in love, under, having the full assurance of your salvation, growing in knowledge and wisdom in the Lord. And the, the end result of that is that you will not be beguiled with enticing words. You will not be led away with enticing words. Let me read the bottom of your paper. This is a result of being grounded deep in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and, and, and who we are in him. Watch the words of Calvin, if you would, on this. And I found these words to be very interesting, commenting on what Paul's saying right here, and I quote, he says, the knowledge of Christ is of itself amply sufficient, and unquestionably, this is the key that can close the door against all base errors. Those are out of danger who remain in Christ, but that those who are not satisfied with Christ are exposed to all fallacies and deceptions. It is a passage, certainly, that ought to be singularly esteemed. For as he who has taught men to know nothing except Christ has provided against all wicked doctrines, unquote. What a statement. And that is so true. You know, the deeper, the more grounded we are, the safer we are against any kind of errors. The less likely we are to be led astray, to be to buy into some kind of heresy that comes in or some false teaching that comes in. Uh, next Sunday morning, I'm really thinking, and I, I don't know if I will, but I'm thinking about going back to Genesis 3 before we go any further in Genesis to understand exactly how Satan works whenever he deceives people. What did he do to Eve? And, and really dissect that conversation to see 
how he took the word of God. He twisted it. He made her question it. He, she added to it and, and then flat out lied to her. But ultimately, what he did was this. He made her feel kind of out of place for believing that believing what God said that you would really die if you ate of the forbidden fruit. And so I use that to say this, that as I said this morning, Satan's tactics are no different today. They're no different. He's got nothing new whatsoever. And so in our world today, if you notice this, if you notice that it is the very same thing, because for those that believe and we, we believe in the truth of God's word today, the world wants, us to, wants to make us feel like there's something wrong with us because we won't graduate to what they say that they have discovered. This is, to them, this is old-fashioned truth. This is, this is old-fashioned, I shouldn't say truth to them. It is old-fashioned writings. And so when you and I want to believe on that, they want to make you feel like you're completely out of place because you're rooted and grounded in this. So what that has a tendency to do is that it's the sin nature that wants to fit in and be accepted by everybody else. And so that's the danger that, that we face in our world today. When we know something to be the truth and to be the facts and we stand on that and it goes against what the world believes, you better believe they're going to come and they're going to try to belittle you for what you believe. That is, that's Satan's tactics. That's the way he works. And so that's exactly what happened to Eve. And, and so then Eve turns around at the, at the end of that conversation and she says, well, we might die. That's basically what she says in the statement, lest you, lest you die. Maybe you will die. And so she basically lightens up the whole, the, the whole warning that God had given. So I just say that to say this, Satan's ways are no different and he works the same way today. And, and you've got to understand that the book that we carry right here, this is bedrock, okay? Understand that, this is bedrock. If there is something in our world that is taught and that is, that is proclaimed that is against this, you can 100% sure know this, it's a lie. If it is not in full agreement with the word of God, it is, it is a lie, don't buy into it. So with that said, that's why we need to be anchored here. You need to be anchored here because this is the bedrock. This is a bedrock. This is the anchor that holds you when the winds of change blow through. And there are going to be many winds of change that will blow through as time goes on. There will be a lot of them. There are going to be a lot of attempts to make you and I uh, feel, like, uh, feel belittled because we stand on, on the truth of God's word. Because the world, does not, the world does not appreciate it even a little bit because it cuts cross grain in what they believe. It cuts cross grain, and so they don't want anything to do with it. Come back to verse 5 now. Watch this. Let's move on a little bit. For though I be absent in the flesh, because he was in prison, yet I am with you in the Spirit. Now watch. Joying and beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Two words there, order and steadfastness. Very important words. Watch your paper. This verse would have been great encouragement for these believers. In this verse, we can see a little more of what the church was like. The words order and steadfastness open a window to see into the body of believers. Both of these words are military terms. According to Vine, the word order, now watch this, speaks of the freedom from disquiet, discord, and disruption. Their readiness to be attentive to those whom God has set over them as spiritual overseers and to be attentive to one another. So, so before I go on, let me say this. So when you read in verse 5, when he says about he's joying and beholding their order, he had heard about their order. And so that means this, that they were disciplined in their mind. That's what it means. Let, let me go on. I think I have it here, so I don't want to repeat myself. This tells us that these people were disciplined in their thoughts. They were able to cast down the thoughts that would cause discord or division. And that's what this heresy was, one of the attempts of the, of the enemy to bring the heresy in would be to cause division within the church. 
So the, well, let me go on. They were disciplined as well as well-trained soldiers who were focused upon the battle and were not distracted by the psychological warfare of the enemy. We sometimes forget that our enemy will bring not only physical attacks, but also he will attack the mind. Psychological warfare, that very same thing. He works, that, that is, is something else that he will bring at, at you and I not only the physical attacks, but the psychological warfare. Just like I said, trying to belittle you for what you believe. If you believe the Word of God, trying to belittle you, getting people to look down on you because you stand for the truth of God's Word. And they don't like it because if they accept the truth of God's Word, then one of the things that they don't like about it is that means that they're going to be answer, answering one day to, a, to their Creator, and they don't want to face that. They don't want to face that. And so they're going to try to belittle you to make themselves feel better. It is psychological warfare because, like I said, our flesh wants to be accepted by everybody. And Satan knows that. Watch uh, what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in, chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5, and 6. He said this, Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, in bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Listen, we, Paul says this, we've got to be disciplined in our minds because Satan will fight a psychological warfare as well. And, and he will try to get thoughts in your mind. He will try to, to distract you with thoughts that you should not have. You ever been in those situations? And just like out of nowhere, there are thoughts that will jump into your mind that you know that are not right. And so that's part of the psychological warfare. We have to be disciplined, and that's what he's saying whenever he uses the word order here, that if I go back to that paragraph that I, that I read for you, that, 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 that the first one underneath 2-5, uh, it, it, it means this, that they had freedom from disquiet, Freedom from discord and freedom from disruption. Boy, that's what we need. Because we live in a world that is just constantly, constantly, nonstop, trying to make noise, trying to cause discord, and trying to cause disruption. And so we need to learn to be able to be quiet and to, to cast those thoughts out and to be focused upon the word of god i'll say this because i know that you can relate to it because i can too because there are times that i've read god's word in the morning i get up and i'll go down on a, in the basement and i'll sit down if it's cold i'm by the wood burner if it's warm out i'm still by the wood burner but there's no fire lit so i sit there and i read but have you ever been in that situation where you're, where you're reading something and you get through to the end and it's like, what did I just read? And your mind is somewhere else, isn't it? Because there are things going on in life. There are things that go on. They, they go on. And so what happens is that we get distracted by all of that. These people here, not perfect, but they had a discipline of the mind to keep those thoughts cast down that would be distracting. They had a discipline of mind to be able to do that. That's what we need. Let me, let me go back here uh, to, the, to the verse again. Watch verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order, okay, that discipline that you got, that military discipline, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now let me get you to that second word. Watch this. The word steadfastness means a solid bulwark, an immovable infantry. It describes an army set out in an unbreakable group, solidly immovable against the shock of the enemy's charge. Within the church, there should be discipline there should be be disciplined believers with strong stead, stead, steadiness like the order and steadiness of a trained and disciplined body of military troops. The question is, how did these believers become this strong? It was through a steady diet of the Word of God. Someone has said 
that a steady diet of solid food will lead to a solid faith. That's what it does. So you want a solid faith? You take a, you take a steady diet of the Word of God, and that's what they were doing. That's what Paul commends them for up in, in verses 2 and 3. That's what they are commended for. This is the way they are. And then he comes down here, and, one, and the results of that, you have this order, you, you have this, this self-discipline, and then you have this steadiness. You have this rock-solid stand in the midst of what is infiltrating in the church. You've got this rock-solid stand. Watch uh, Psalm 18, 1 and 2. I, I just pulled these verses, came to my mind whenever I was prepping this. It says, I, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, in the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I think last week, I, I, I don't know if I used that verse, but I used a verse with the word buckler in. A buckler was a shield that would surround the soldier, that would protect him on all sides. That's what our God is. That's what our God is. So why would we not draw closer to him? In the midst of this world in which we live in, why would we not draw closer to him? And here in these verses, you get the, you get the result of what happens. The closer you get, the stronger you become. We, we, we get self-discipline to be able to block the things out in our minds. You know, one of the problems in the world, and I'll say it for what it is, and, and we can all be guilty of it, and that's screen time, you know? I, I, I think I, years ago I read something where, you know, before you go to bed, you ought to get away from the screen either on your phone or on your computer for, I don't know, maybe an hour before you go to bed because if you spend screen time, then it gets the mind going very rapidly uh and then it it disrupts you so there are so many things that'll steal our thoughts away in our world in the world in which we live in and so i will say this there's nothing as important in life as getting that rock solid stand on christ there's nothing that important especially in the day and age in which we live in today you need it. I need it. We, we need what he's describing right here. We need the order. We need the steadfastness. We need that because of everything that is unfolding in our world today so that we are not shaken. That we're not shaken when things come along. L let me show you something here. In Psalm 3, we see the result of a man deep in his relationship with the Lord in the midst of the storms of life. It's written by David when his world was falling apart. So I'm gonna, let me give you the background on this, first of all, and then I'll read it, because this always fascinated me to think about what he read, what he wrote here, and what was going on. So, so David wrote this, as well as Psalm 61, when Absalom tried to undermine him. And he had gotten chased out of the palace, and he was fleeing. You remember whenever he was fleeing away, there was, a, there was a guy that came at him named Shimei and cursed him and kicked dirt at him and threw stones at him, and uh, one of David's bodyguards wanted to go over and take his head off, and David wouldn't let him. Uh, I've often said, boy, there's just times it's been, it'd have been nice to have one of those bodyguards just to say, get him, you know, and then just move on. But David wouldn't do that. David wouldn't do that. So, so he was fleeing, and, and they had taken David's uh, personal counselor, Ahithophel. They, they had stolen him away. Uh, and so David's world was caving in when he wrote this. Watch what he writes. Now watch this. He said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Now you can understand why he writes that, because it seems like, uh, Absalom has got this coup together and they're, and they're trying to overthrow David to the point that Absalom wants to see his father die. He's willing to, to take his father, have his father's life taken away just so that he can have the throne. So he says this, how are they increased that trouble me? Uh, many there be which rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. There's that psychological warfare. You know, when your world's falling in, when, it, when, it's, when things are caving in around you, 
And then there's that thought in your mind that Satan plants there. Where's your God now? Where's your God now? Why would he, why would he let this happen? Why would he let your world cave in? Does he really love you? What have you done to bring all of this about? You know, is there something wrong in, in, in your life? What, what have you done? Remember what you did here. Remember what you did there. And so he will bring up the past, things that you've already confessed and dealt with and moved on from, but he'll bring them up because it's a psychological warfare. And so he wants to, he wants to do everything he can to discourage you. And so just like in verse 2 says, many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. There's no help for him at all in God. Verse 3. But, now we're going to flip it around. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. There's that buckler. A shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of mine head. I love that. The lifter of his head. David got down at times. God was the one that would pick his chin back up. God was the one that would give him encouragement. Was David perfect? By no means. By no means. Was he perfect? Verse 4. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. Now watch verse 5. This is just amazing to me. He says, I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I say, what? You're on the run, David. You're on the run. Your own son is pursuing you, and your own son okayed the idea to take your life and you can lay down and you can sleep how'd you do that the lord sustained him remember what i said this is the result what's written here is the result of a man that is deep in his relationship with his lord this is the results when the world falls apart he can still lay down and he can sleep verse six he says, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Hmm. David had a grip on that relationship. His life wasn't perfect by any means. His world was falling apart, but he had that relationship, just like he reflected on whenever he wrote Psalm 23. But if you read Psalm 61, he wrote it about the same time that he was going through all of this, too. And he said in there, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. David knew that he had a rock in his life, and that the Lord was that rock, and he was anchored to that rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Almost gives the idea that maybe he felt like he was sinking and drowning in the things that were going on in his life. You ever been there? You ever been in a situation in life where you just, you feel like you can't hardly get your nose above the water? And whenever you do, it's like there's somebody said years ago, somebody swims up below and jerks one of your flippers off and you start to go back down but you know in those times there is a rock that is higher than us and the rock speaks of something solid a place a place of safety and a place of security and that's what david had and that's what we have and the more we know our lord the more we understand that he is our rock in those times and the more solid we become we become then in our in our lives we we have the order and we have the steadfastness in our life that brings me now to the walk watch verse six he says have you as ye therefore as ye have therefore received christ jesus the lord so walk ye in him what's he saying here how'd you get saved how'd you get saved you got saved by grace through faith you exercise faith you receive Christ by faith, so walk in the same faith. That's what he's saying. Watch the paragraph. How had they received Jesus Christ? By faith. Paul then calls them to live by faith now. They were saved by faith, and they were to live by faith. In other words, they were to trust in the Lord, to meet all their needs, to guide and to direct them and to bless them with all spiritual blessings. 
What did this have to do with the heresy that had come into the church? The heretics were teaching that Jesus Christ was not enough, but that there were other things they needed to follow, either philosophy, ceremonies, angel worship, and so on. Paul was very clear in this verse that Jesus Christ could give him give them the spiritually abundant life if they were to just simply trust in him that's what he's saying trust him walk by faith in him he's all you need that's what he's saying in this watch uh, hebrews 10 there's a there's i think there's three places in god's word that tell us the just shall live by faith but here's one of them and, and i thought this fit very well Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Remember, let, let me give you a, a little background here on Hebrews. These people that received the letter written by, we don't know who. Some people think Paul. There's a lot of speculation but the bottom line is the bible doesn't tell us who wrote the book of hebrews we don't have that info so we don't know who penned it but we do know this that it was written to hebrew christians that had come out of judaism the temple is still standing when this is when this letter is written and they're being persecuted for their faith and some of them are contemplating going back to judaism they are contemplating that and so the writer of hebrews says no 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 you can't go back you've got to stay the course you've got to stay the course you've got to press forward so with that said let me read the verses again if i could cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward for ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of god ye might receive the promise for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry okay so just stay strong the lord's coming back keep your faith in him wait for him that's what he's saying verse 38 now the just shall live by faith okay there's what paul's saying right here but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. He said, look, you're not reprobates. You are true believers. And you need to continue to press forward. Walk by faith. Live by faith. That's what Paul's saying right here. Trust in the Lord. Just put all your faith in him. You've been saved by faith. Now live by faith. And you know what? That's, we need to learn that. We need to learn that in life. And it, it's a lot of people never get there. They struggle through life and worry about things. We, the, 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 the thing is this, that a lot of times we will, and, and I hope you do, you trust Christ for the salvation of your soul, the most precious, precious possession that you have but isn't it rather strange that we can't trust him to meet our daily needs we can trust him to make sure that our soul ends up in his presence and that we will never experience the fires of hell we will never experience the lake of fire none of those things we won't experience that and we believe that and we trust in him for that but when it comes to the everyday needs we struggle and we worry and we stress we get depressed we get discouraged because we lack faith lord bring us all to that place where we can trust you with every single situation that comes in life that's what he's telling them to do look he's saying this basically and i'm putting words in his mouth but uh, let me do that look christ in him are all the riches just trust in him you were saved by faith, now walk by faith. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him the same way. Live by faith. Trust in him. Watch verse 7, if you would. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Here's another verse that's loaded. Rooted and built up. What, let, me, let me show you something. Watch your paper. This verse has so much spiritual truth for us. Notice 
that we are rooted in Jesus. Okay, so you're going to get two. You're going to get you're you're going to get two pictures from this verse. You're going to get the picture of a tree growing, and you're going to get the picture of a building built on a foundation. Two two pictures found in this verse. I'll show them to you. Watch this. This verse has so much spiritual truth for us. Notice that we are rooted in Jesus. He's the soil in which we are planted. And it's in him that our roots, that our roots are to go down deep. Uh, Jeremiah 17, I gave you Psalm 1 last week, and we weren't in this verse, but this verse, these verses kind of parallel Psalm 1. Jeremiah 17, 17, or 7 and 8 say this, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as the tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Okay, so that's what we're like when we're rooted in him. And that's the idea here, rooted and built up. Okay, so let me go on. The word rooted is in the perfect tense. Now watch this. It could read, having been rooted. This means, this is so rich, this means that it is an act that took place once and for all with permanent results. That's the idea of that word. You are rooted. You have been rooted once for all. That's the idea of the verse. Once for all. You can't get rooted a couple times. You get rooted once. You get saved. You're rooted in him. Okay, so now it's our responsibility to grow. Watch verse again, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let me go back to your paper. The words built up are in the present tense, which indicates a constant process from day to day. Therefore, we can look at the verse and say that Jesus Christ is the foundation and we are the building. See what I said? There's two pictures here. You got a picture of a tree being rooted. Now you got a picture of a building uh, being built up. And, and let me go on here. Uh, we are the building that is constantly being built as we grow in Him. Watch the words of Barclay on these two verses. He pulls them both together. He says this, and I quote, There are two pictures here. The word used for rooted is the word which would be used of a tree with its roots deep in the soil. The word used for build is the word which would be used of a house erected on a firm foundation. Because as the great tree is deep-rooted in the soil and draws its nourishment from it, so the Christian is rooted in Christ, the source of his life and strength. Just as the house stands fast because it's built on a strong foundation, so the Christian life is uh, resistant to any storm because it is founded on the strength of Christ. Christ is uh, like the source of the Christian's life and the foundation of his stability. What a, I mean, the words that are used here are absolutely amazing. Rooted and built up. That's what we're to be. Like a tree rooted down deep. Like a, like a building built on a foundation. Continue building. Continue growing. That's the idea. Let me read verse 7 one more time. It says, Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Back to your paper. Paul also exhorted them to be established in the faith. This follows the idea that after we are planted, then we grow. And the more we grow, the more secure we become in the faith. The word established is also in the present tense, which means that this is an ongoing process. We are never as secure in the faith as what we could be. There's always more of our Lord to know, and there's always more growth to be experienced. You see the same word in Romans 16, 25. I have 25 and 26. 25 is where the word is. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. He's the one that causes the growth. He's the one that causes the growth. We walk by faith. He causes the growth. That's the idea. In the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which is kept secret since the world began. I'll stop right there. Let me go on to the next one. Now he's going to give a warning. This is where we're going to end it out tonight. We're not going to get very far in a warning either. Uh, I wanted to end up a little bit early because of our communion. Watch verse 8. He says this, Beware, be careful, 
You see, any, let me say this. Anytime you see the word beware in the word of God, you better pay very close attention to it. Uh, I remember one time uh, years ago, a long time ago, I went with Pastor Richie somewhere, and uh, we were down Cumberland Valley Way, and uh, there was, uh, he said, we're going to stop. We're going to stop here, and we're going to visit. We're going to see if these people were home. He said, I wanted to visit with them. And so he pulls up, and there's about two inches of snow on the ground, and I had slippery shoes on. And he said, go up there and knock on the door and see if they're home. I said, no. He said, he laid, smiled. He said, why not? I said, Do it, where's the dog at? He said, well, I don't know if there is one. I said, neither do I. And I said, I can't run in slippery shoes with two inches of snow. I said, how about you blow the horn? Because I said, I'm not very good out there on that slippery stuff. So we sat there and laughed for a while, and they, they weren't home. We could tell no lights on, and so neither one of us got out of the car. And if there would have been a sign that said, beware of the dog, I can assure you I would have never got out of the car. Uh, random dogs and I do not get along very well for some reason. I don't know why. But anyhow, if you go somewhere and, and somebody's got a sign that says, beware of the dog, you're going to be very careful. How much more when you come to the Word of God and it says, beware, that better, your attention better get zeroed in. So watch what he says behind this now. Watch verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I'll say this. The wording in the verse, and we're not going to get to it today, tonight. We'll get to it next week. The wording in the verse is designed to basically attack the heretics in what they were teaching. That's the idea. But, but let me show you. I just want to focus on the spoil, first of all. The word spoil here tells us much about the danger of, being of not being established in the faith. To spoil does not refer to something like food that has been spoiled. That's not the idea. Get that out of your mind. The word spoil here refers to stealing something from us. Like, well, let me put it, give it to you. Just like an enemy would come to war and spoil a city by carrying away valuables. They would carry off the spoils. That's the idea here. Beware lest any man spoil you. Come in and carry away the riches that you have. Now what's he talking about in this? We'll come back up to verse 2. Let me show you something. Let me connect this. Just now thought of this. Watch this. That their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all the riches a full assurance of understanding and acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father of Jesus Christ in whom were hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So they've got the goal behind it is to get to those riches. Okay, so watch this. So what Paul is saying here is that the enemy, as he works through false teachers, he longs to steal away the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Let me show you a picture from David's life. I think this is something that happened to David whenever he and his men were out. They were fighting the Philistines. They came back to their city that was known as Ziklag. Uh, the, watch what happens in 1 Samuel 30, okay, 1 through 6. It says this, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken, watch this, the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives, took all of them, took them away. Watch this. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives were taken captives, Hinnaman, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Went on to rescue everything that had been taken away, to get it back. But let me just say this. It is the enemy's desire, if he can, to steal away the spoils that we have in Christ. 
watch, let, let, me give you, well, let me get you back to your paper here. I'll, I'll finish you out. What does the enemy steal from believers when they get caught up in a false teaching? And you don't even have to get caught up in a false teaching. You just get, if he can just come and steal something, what's he going to take? Watch this. He steals away, uh, I have there, uh, let me put it, let me make it more personal. He steals away our peace. He'll steal away our rest. He'll steal away our fellowship. He'll steal away our power. And the list goes on and on. He spoils the believer of whatever he can take. That's what he wants to do. He wants to take away your, he, he, wants, to, he wants to take away your assurance. He wants to take away the peace that you have. And he wants to take away the rest that, that God has promised to you in Christ. He wants to steal all of that away from you. And that's what Paul's talking about right here. All those riches that we have in Christ. He says, beware. Because this, these people come in, you buy into what they have, and the next thing you know, you've just been robbed blind. The enemy's come in, and he's taken it all away. So I have it the, the conclusion there. Next week, uh, we will look at Colossians 2, 8, more detail, to see how Paul counters the heretics. That's what he's doing with the language. He was very sharp and pointed with the language that he used uh, whenever, whenever he penned verse 8. And it was directed right to those heretics, and they would have known that also. So anyhow, I mean, if you, if you were to get nothing else out of what we, were, what we look at here in these verses in Colossians, you get this, the need to be rooted and grounded in God's Word. And uh, we live in a day and age today where, I, as I told you this morning, Satan is going to attack God's people. He's going to do everything he can to spoil, to, to pollute the message that we have by, by trying to get us caught up in some kind of false teaching. Uh, he will try to distract us with whatever he can. He knows what our flesh likes. He will tempt us with uh, the desires of the flesh there are just so many things and so we got to be disciplined we've got to have that order and that steadfastness if we're going to stand in the day and age in which we live let's pray father thank you thank you so much for what we can learn from paul's pen as he wrote to these colossian believers lord there's a need in our day there is a need for us to be to be established in the faith to have that order and to have that steadfastness. Lord, to be disciplined in the mind, disciplined in spirit, to be able to, to block out and not let in the things that should not be into our minds, to, to be able to uh, put on the helmet of salvation, basically to protect the mind because we are in this spiritual battle and it's increasing. It's getting hotter and hotter as the days go on. So, Lord, as we go through the, continue through the letter, Lord, just uh, strengthen all of us. Help us to learn and to grow. That's our desire. Now, Father, set our minds on your table as we remember what our Savior did tonight. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians.